What is up, Coaster fans, and welcome back to the Coaster Rundown. Today is episode five. My name is Cole, aka Park Pros. I'm joined as always with my good friend Jack, aka Coaster John. Jack, how are we doing this week? I'm doing great, Cole. It's good to be back, man. Let's get right into it. Yeah, let's jump right into it. In a year that was supposed to be a celebration of parks being fully back open, we have just another tragic story of an accident on the Haunted Mind Drop ride at Glenwood Caverns in Colorado. This accident um, unfortunately resulted in the death of a six-year-old girl, um, and we certainly give our thoughts and prayers to the girl's family. Um, for those who are not familiar with this ride, it's essentially like a drop tower um, that drops you underground straight away instead of, you know, the traditional lift hill and then um, dropping down. The ride does not have an over-the-shoulder restraint and instead utilizes a safety belt system across riders' laps um, with an unlockable metal bar at the end and then has a secondary safety belt uh, like you would see on most roller coasters. The ride's height restriction is also 48 inches. And with the victim being so young, it seems like that could have had something to do with this accident. But Jack, all in all, this is just a, a horrible tragedy, and it seems like it it probably could have been avoided. Um, what are your thoughts on all this? Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, like just like you said, you know, thoughts and prayers to the family, you know, of of all the loved ones. You know, it is really tragic story and so young too you know it's 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 honestly like out of all the different tragedies that have that have happened this year this might be you know up there as one of the worst so it, it really is unfortunate timing you know for the park you know they just had that good news with defiance um and now they're looking at this you know terrible tragedy that's occurred um i think the you know the future of the ride might definitely be in question you know um, and park definitely this summer has had pretty much its like highest high and its lowest low i mean it's it's been, it's been really tough for the park i'm sure the thing is too like it's just like it's just been such a terrible year like you mentioned like it, it just keeps happening like it's been almost like a couple times a month it seems where somebody's either getting hurt or you know something tragic's happening here and there and it's just it's just you know added to the list it's really been it's really been a tough one yeah and i wonder if this trend that we're seeing kind of across the amusement industry of all these you know tragic uh, like avoidable accidents has something to do with you know, the widespread staffing issues we've seen across the theme park industry this entire year. Do they just not have enough people at these parks to be, you know, making sure that these rides are being maintained safely? Or is this just a fluke? Yeah, Cole, I mean, I was going to say the exact same thing. It, it really like, you know, eventually it comes to the point where, you know, it's it's not just a bunch of coincidences. It's starting to be a real trend in the amusement industry that, you know, like all these different things occurring. And I, I think you hit it right on the head. Um, I think it could definitely be, you know, factored into the staffing issues, you know. I think another thing that could have contributed to a lot of these different amusement park accidents, too, has been, you know, the pandemic. The parks being closed for a, new, a, a number of months, probably not being properly maintained during those during that time. So, you know, it's definitely been, you know, tough for parks, you know, reopening and stuff. I think that's definitely has to be some sort of contr uh, contribution to all these different things that have happened this year. And I think, you know, Glenwood Caver Caverns is also, you know, a victim of that. Yeah. And talking about this accident specifically and how it relates to Glenwood Caverns, um, like you said before, with the announcement of Defiance, which was a really kind of, you know, high point for the park. Um, and they've seemed to be kind of taking strides in the last, you know, five to 10 years to become more of a legitimate theme park rather than just a side attraction. Um, and having an accident like accident like this certainly does not really help that image. But yeah, any way that you look at this is just such a tragic accident. And again, you know, our thoughts and prayers, the entire coaster communities are with the family and uh, we just hope that we don't see anything like this the remainder of 2021 because it has been a pretty um, tragic year in the coaster industry. Yeah, I couldn't have said it better myself, Cole. But, you know, let's move on to some better news. You know, this is supposed to be a fun, upbeat show. Kennywood has begun an inclusive campaign regarding the future of Phantom's Revenge. Uh, the Morgan Hyper has had, has recently had some fading paint. And uh, instead of just repainting Phantom's Revenge on their own, like most parks do, Kennywood instead has decided to allow fans of the park to choose the fate of their A-list attraction, which I think is super exciting. Um, coaster enthusiasts and the general public alike have had the opportunity to vote over the last few days on Kennywood's website between either Petrifying Purple or Terrifying Teal. This comes almost immediately after park goers noticed the section of repainted track. So Cole, what do you think about this whole choose the color campaign that Kennywood has put together? Yeah, I think it's really cool. Um, like you said, the uh, paint job on Phantom's Revenge was definitely 
fading a little bit. There was a little bit of chipping going on. Um, at the time we're recording this video, we'll find out, I think, tonight uh, what the result of that is going to be. From everything I've seen on the internet, fan polls, whatever, um, on Instagram, it seems like everyone's rocking with the purple. I'm also team purple, I think. Um, it just fits the theme a lot better. I think it's going to look gorgeous with those black supports. Um, and it'll, it'll be nice to just kind of have a little bit of a change up after, you know, 20 years of Phantom's Revenge. And that iconic green tealish color was, uh, was very fitting for that time. But it's nice to see a little bit of a change. And I'm glad that the, the uh, park is taking some time to repaint the ride. I don't know, man. I, I'm, I'm digging the terrifying teal. You know, I, I was always a big fan of that color. You know, that, that was definitely, you know, one of my favorite aspects of the ride was it's, you know, uh, color palette, however fading it was. Um, but hey, <laughs> the internet has spoken 75% right now, you know, are, are choosing petrifying purple. Yeah, and between this and uh, Iron Guazi, we're getting some love for the purple palette coaster. So lots uh, of purple track coming in. <laughs> yeah, yes, sir. So on to some news out of Japan, the world's fastest accelerating coaster Dota Dompa at Fuji-Q Highland has been temporarily shut down by the local government. So since December of 2020, between four and six people have suffered broken bones on the ride. And the government in conjunction with the park have closed it until they can determine what the cause of these injuries are. As many of you recall, the ride was renovated in 2017, which increased the ride's acceleration from 107 miles per hour in 1.8 seconds to 112 miles per hour in 1.6 seconds. And of course, they added that vertical loop. Um, and some people have speculated that it, these injuries could be a result of the ride becoming just more intense and rough as it's aged. But Jack, I've never heard of anything even remotely like this before in the amusement industry. This is a crazy story. What are your thoughts? Well, I feel like if this happened in America, it, I, as soon as one person even had any sort of like a concussion or one little broken bone, this ride would have been shut down. But the fact that multiple people have had broken bones and it took this long to shut down is pretty crazy. Obviously, Fuji Q Highland seems like a really cool park. You know, it's got some of the top tier coasters in Japan, if not the world. You know, they've got Ijunaika, they've got obviously Dota Dompa, you know, um, Takabisha, all these different crazy coasters. Um, and obviously, you know, this is this one's got the fastest acceleration and it's only gotten even faster over the years, you know. So I think what could have possibly contributed to these people's broken bones could be that vertical loop that they added. You know, I mean, obviously those could be some pretty high G-forces. G we, we could speculate all we want. You know, it, it is really unfortunate that, that these people have gotten injured. And it is a crazy story to hear it. But, you know, it's good that, you know, the park's finally going to be doing something about it. But it is pretty scary. Yeah, and from the reports that have come out, the majority of injuries, the broken bones, were both neck and back, which kind of has me thinking that maybe it has something to do with the launch. I mean, that's a pretty intense launch um, but from the reports that have come out the engineers just seem completely stumped on what could even possibly be causing this i mean the ride's been down for a week or two now and they reportedly have no idea what's going on so i hope that this isn't a long-term issue kind of like what we discussed with dragster last week where it's like do you remove the ride but i think this one seems more likely than you know dragster which was a little bit of a mechanical fluke this one seems like this ride just might be too intense too dangerous in its current form to you know ever reopen again i mean hey maybe, maybe they'll renovate it again maybe they'll remove the loop and do something else i mean you know they've already done it once what's stopping them from doing it again yeah but all in all just an, an insane story like you never think that you're going to ride a roller coaster especially us coaster yeah. enthusiasts Berserk. there's never even that that thought that even crosses your mind and for it to happen to half a dozen people it's, it's just insane so six flags over georgia's wait for mindbender to open is finally over the park recently announced that its schwarzkopf multi-looper which has been closed for almost two years now will reopen to the public on saturday september 18th premier rides has been renovating the coaster by replacing some of the track pieces and installing new trains and speaking of those new trains uh, i think this announcement comes as a surprise to many i know it's a surprise to me because the only testing footage anyone has seen of, of mindbender was these really weird looking trains which are more or less just like the metal frames of the trains and they do not appear to be complete whatsoever they just seem you know kind of hollow that footage came to us courtesy of in the loop so thank you guys for capturing that now cole since we haven't seen any footage of the fully constructed trains are you surprised as i am to hear this announcement um i'm not surprised it shouldn't take six flags 18 months to renovate one of their coasters in any circumstances um, I guess that yeah, that in itself isn't that surprising that it took that long. So when it comes to the train, I think what we're seeing is just the chassis. 
Um, I think the trains are supposed to be something like the new revolution that we saw at Six Flags Magic Mountain, that renovation that we had a couple years ago. And actually one of the new revolutions trains showed up at over Georgia, you know, sometime last spring. So I think we're gonna see something like the new revolution trains where it's more of a boxy kind of setup. I think what we just saw is basically the metal frame of the trains. Um, so I wouldn't be too discouraged about that. Uh, but it, I'm happy that this ride is finally opening. It's the second best coaster at Six Flags Over Georgia, in my opinion. Um, it's just a classic ride. I'm happy to see another one of these classic Schwarzkopf's kind of getting the love that they deserve from Six Flags, even if it took them, you know, 18 months to do it which is ridiculous but <laughs> yeah it is pretty ridiculous but i'm excited to get back there i mean i'm sure i'll get back there next year to atlanta for the new fun spot rmc so on to our final topic of the day a few weeks ago on the show we gave you a construction update on the brand new lost island theme park opening in waterloo iowa in 2022 and since then the park has actually released their official park logo and an actual map on their website. Not very long after that, Jack, Adventureland, the park just down the road in Altoona, Iowa, announced the addition of nine new attractions in their park for 2022, most of which are children and family oriented. Um, but Jack, I've speculated a lot on my channel that an Iowa coaster war between these two parks was kind of brewing. Um, and it seems like we're finally getting the first punches in that. So Jack, first, give me your impression on the Lost Island logo and kind of concept map that they gave us. And second, what do you think of Adventureland making a pretty big splash to kind of build out the depth of their parks, you know, family-oriented attractions? Well, just like you said, it's gonna be an Iowa coaster war and it's really exciting for the area. I haven't been to uh, the Midwest at all, but you know, I'm definitely going to prioritize that area, you know, once this new park opens up. It's nice to see a ground up amusement park, which I shouldn't even really be calling an amusement park park necessarily because it seems like it's going to be a much more themed park um, than a lot of other uh, parks in the area um, obviously you know they came out with a bunch of different like areas and the, their their park map and stuff and their logo seems great and you know the whole the whole park in general just seems like so fresh and original for the area and for the country as a whole um, so obviously you know Adventureland seemed to have to step up their game and kind of you know announce a bunch of new stuff for the park I mean obviously they've gotten Dragon Slayer recently um, which is you know great for them um, and as you mentioned, they're going to be announced, you know, they, they've already announced uh, nine new attractions for the park, but it's kind of like quantity over quality. Like there, there are a lot of like really small kitty attractions. Like the, you have kitty coasters and then you have like even smaller than small kitty coasters. Like they're almost installing like the little rides you, you see at the mall. <laughs> like you put a quarter in and you ride it. Regardless, you know, um, it does seem really great for the park and really great for the area in general. It's just competition is the best thing you know like that's what is gonna, gonna always keep parks you know trying to add new additions you know like any parks that are in, near each other in any way they're going to be trying to compete for you know park guests and try to make the most money and it's definitely exciting yeah and to your point the park in the past has had a couple problems first it's kind of had like a carnival feel to it rides are just kind of like plopped into open spaces open fields and the second issue is there was not a lot of offerings for small children and even families um, they don't really have a kitty area of the park so i think what this was doing is just kind of addressing that not only building out their you know their entire catalog of rides but just giving more offerings to young families and kids so yeah i mean that is good that the parks you know addressing their problem with you know lack of kitty rides i definitely did not know that because like i said i haven't been out there um but you know it, I, to me it is still a little bit bizarre that they're just kind of placing them all around the park it seems like they're kind of you know sticking to their mantra of almost being a little bit like a carnival where you know there's a ride here a ride there when most you know major parks usually have like one kids area or you know uh, one or two kids areas but either way you know as long as they can have uh, attractions that uh, satisfy the whole family i'm on board in any case adding nine new attractions is definitely you know a significant development for a park even if they are you know smaller cheaper attractions um and this is definitely something as the years go on that i'm going to be keeping an eye on because Come 2023, you know, Lost Island's going to be in line for their first, you know, new expansion to the park. And you have to wonder whether or not uh, Adventureland's going to be bringing something, you know, out of their pockets to match that. So definitely, like you said, competition is always great in this industry. It creates, you know, parks having to bring out the best of themselves. So um kind of an interesting first start to this little bit of a coaster rivalry we're getting in iowa that's it for this week's coaster rundown thank you all for tuning in jack anything you want to plug this week 
Yeah, you know, the NFL season's right around the corner, and I've got a bunch of different coaster-related videos uh, on my channel about that. You know, check out NFL Coaster Concepts. I've got a lot of recent episodes up there on the channel, uh, and there's never been a better time to go check it out. So go ahead and do it. And if you missed it last week, I uploaded a video kind of detailing my thoughts on Michigan's adventure after my trip there late August. So go and check that out if you haven't seen that yet. That's it for this week's Coaster Rundown. Thank you, as always, for watching and tuning in, and we'll see you next week.